to this. So first of all, I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, I, um, as, as Kayla said, I'm in the middle of writing a, a book. I've been working on this book for a very long time in one way or another. I'll say more about that uh, soon. And I know that I'm going to learn a lot. Uh, I've already learned a lot from uh, putting this together as a set of classes, which I've never done before. I've, I've, sp I've spoken about this in various ways, but not, not exactly in this format. And so it's already been very helpful for me. And I know I'm going to learn a lot from you. Uh, and that's the main reason why I wanted to do this is to um, get, uh, and I, one of the things that's been really, really rewarding for me over the years that I've been working on this is um, the feedback that I've gotten, the input. Uh, there are many, many ideas in here that I can point to specific people who have given me uh, input over the years, um, mostly not fellow academics, uh, mostly uh, friends and other people who I've sort of uh, co-opted to get interested in this project. Uh, and that, that, now that includes you. <laughs> so thank you in advance for that. My goal is that this is, um, if you're participating in this, and you know, I'm not going to take attendance, so we'll see if, uh, how many of you last through the, the five sessions or not. Hopefully people will join after. Uh, that this will be, you know, it'll be because, and this is one thing I really love about continuing ed uh, and adult education, and I do a lot of executive education uh, in my day job. Uh, I love about, What I love about it is that people participate because they really want to. Uh, it's sort of lishma, and so I'm really excited about that. And so I'm trying to design it and make this as meaning as possible. So to that end, um, I'm going to share at the end, there's going to be a form that I'm going to encourage people, uh, encourage you all to fill out that just says basically a little bit gives me some context about who you are and what you might be interested in and I'll try to you know adjust. Uh, I'll do some adjusting um, over the course of, of the sessions. I do you know I think it's fine not to be on video um, but uh, hopefully at least when you speak you'll want to be on, on, on video. I do know that one of the great things about uh, Zoom in this, this kind of format um, that we've all kind of discovered uh, by force, uh, by necessity over the course of the pandemic is that, you know, uh, I'm sure there are many people um, this evening, probably myself too, because I live in Boston, wouldn't be able to participate in, in something like this, but now we can, that's great. And it means that you might want to multitask and I do that too. Uh, hopefully I can get you to be engaged. Um, one thing I'll say also, so I do I want to limit chat comments um, during, it's going to be hard for me to follow. Uh, so if you send chats there, I'm going to be tempted to look at it. I'm actually not going to look at it until I'll try to take breaks uh, roughly every 15 minutes or so. Um, the other thing I want to say is that tonight um, in particular, but probably I'll do this throughout, um, there will be opportunities. So I'm going to be actually sending, um, asking you to provide input in the form of um, text and poll responses as we engage with texts. Uh, and so um, you'll get to see your you know, input on the screen. It'll, it'll hopefully be really helpful to see where everyone is at. And I have a lot of good experience with that. Um, and so um, that's one reason just to be alert. So like, you know, you may be thinking about something and you may be washing the dishes uh, while you're listening to this. And I have done that before. Um, but then you'll, you know, uh, you're not alert to the possibility that I'll be asking you for input. We won't get the input from you. Uh, and, that'll, and we'll all be uh, um, worse off for that. Um, okay, and I mentioned, um, about the chat comments as well. Um, I'm gonna say something at the end about the organization of the lectures. Hopefully it'll become clear. The, I'll call them lectures, I'll call them sessions. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, try to be adaptive. I'll see what works, what doesn't work. Um, one thing I know is that my jokes will fall really flat as they do on Zoom. Um, though I can see, see if your video's on, I can see Alana just smiled at that. So thank you, Alana, for that, I appreciate that. Um, but no one else smiled and no one, I can't see anyone else, so who knows, right? Um, I'm going to stay on a little extra time today. So if you do have questions that you think I'm not getting to, I, I want to, in part because I want to hear, um, you know, how things are working for you or not. And so I'll, I'll spend a little time extra um, uh, tonight and um, maybe other weeks too. We'll see how that goes. Um, don't feel you have to get, stay on, obviously. All right. So let me jump right in. And let me tell you the story of how I got into this, which is um, one of the, um, I think, best ways of you to, to explain sort of what this is all about. And um, so it says here that it began with um, astonishment at something that I learned and maybe a bit of a crisis. And so what do we mean by that? So when I, I so a little bit about myself, um, I grew up in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, I see a um, dear, dear, dear family friend is on the call tonight. Uh, and so it brings back having memories of various things together, including Shabbat. Uh, this is a part of what this project is all about, why it's meaningful to me. And, um, 
a funky background in various ways, but let's say modern Orthodox, not exactly, but sort of um, upbringing in, in, uh, in various respects. And, but I'm not, you know, so I think people think about sort of, let's put on this broad head, head, heading of science and Torah or science and faith or something like that. I think there are all kinds of people who are sort of interested in that uh, and how to, how to reconcile science and Torah. I was never that kind of person. Uh, I think there's all, I have kind of, uh, you know, a couple of excuses for that, um, or at least maybe put it this way, a couple of solutions for that, the problem of science, the tension between science and Torah or science and Judaism. Um, one way I solved it was basically being ignorant uh, in general uh, about science and Torah, both, right? So ignorance is bliss. Um, you can solve a lot of problems by just not being very knowledgeable. Um, and I'm not very knowledgeable, actually, even though I'm at MIT. I'm probably the least knowledgeable faculty member at MIT about science and engineering. They never actually interested me that very much. I'm a social scientist. Uh, that's another one of my solutions to the problem is like social science. Come on. No one ever, who's ever heard of, you know, social science and Torah uh, or social science and Judaism being sort of an issue. So that's a good way to hide. And more generally, I think what we tend to do is to solve the problem by compartmentalizing, right? And in fact, my guess is that in a typical Jewish class, tensions between science and Torah don't usually come up very much. Uh, we can compart compartmentalize. They do come up a lot, Kayla, you're saying? Uh, not very much, yeah. We compartmentalize, it's good. It, it makes things work very nicely. But I had, my crisis was about not being able to compartmentalize anymore. And it was about social science and Torah. So this is a book, I highly recommend this book. I would not be here today, I would not be, I'm talking about this if it weren't for this book. Uh, very interesting uh, man, Aviatar Zubavel, a sociologist like me, uh, been an earlier generation, Israeli originally, but he's been teaching at Rutgers for many years. And Zubavel is a sociologist of time. And I don't remember how, but I ran across this book. It had been, I think, first published in 84. And I was in graduate school as a, uh, to get my PhD in sociology about 10 years later. Um, I was there from 92, 97. I don't remember exactly when I ran, ran across the book. And the book hit me. It was just a, a while. I had never thought about the seven day week before uh, in any, mean, any meaningful sense. I assumed, like I would contend every one of us does. Uh, in fact, every one of us in this generation and for many generations going back, especially Jewish uh, or in the West, we grow up thinking, we grow up um, uh, imagining that the seven day week is built into nature. It's primordial, it's natural, that um, it's been something that we have, we human beings have experienced from time immemorial uh, and will always experience. And so uh, everything about that is false, scientifically. Uh, and that's what Ravel's book is about, not only about that, it's about calendrical systems and you might say, uh, scheduling platforms, that's a term that I use, you wouldn't use that, uh, all around the world. It's kind of a grand tour of these kinds of systems. And what it does is it contextualizes the seven-day week. What is the seven-day week? And so the seven-day week is not built into nature, right? Many people, I, my experience is that people, most people learn about this one way or another. And for many people, it's kind of a big surprise. Uh, what's notable is that people don't learn this through just inspecting the world. Like, why can't you go outside and figure this out? Because you know, if you have a dog or a cat, a pet, right? They don't know about the days of the week, right? Your plants don't know about the days of the week, right? It's, it's not something that actually shows up in nature in any meaningful way, right? This shows up in Chazal. So Shlomo Zukir is giving a, a series in uh, for Drisha and his next lecture, I think is about a famous Gemara, which is about what happens if you're on the road and you get in the Midbar and you don't know what day of the week it is. There's nothing out there that will tell you what day of the week it is, right? In Defoe's uh, Robinson Crusoe on a desert island, he names his friend, I, was, I think it's Monday, right? Or Thursday, I forget, I don't know if anybody knows. You can put that in the chat. Um, because he's trying to like, you know, he misses the rhythms of the day of the week. Uh, so many people think that the day of the week somehow has something, something to do with the month, right? That it's a, some kind of fraction of the lunar month. That is, let me say this very clearly, false. Uh, the seven day week has nothing to do with the month. Uh, so as we know in Judaism, we're now in what we're right between uh, the, you know, the um, two days of Rosh Chodesh uh, that the uh, days of the month, right? Are 20, roughly 29 and a half days. Uh, if you were gonna try to come up with a cycle of days, that is a number of days, a multiple that you were cycling and you wanted to sync with the lunar month, 
right? Um, the best you could do is having five, six day weeks, right? Put that in scare quotes. That's not a week as we know it. Or six, five day weeks in square, square quotes. But you would quickly come out of sync. And you'd have to do something to fix the problem, right? Sort of like we do when we intercalate, right? We, do, we, we come up with, uh, um, you know, a shanamu beret. We'd have to come up with some kind of way of fixing the calendar. It wouldn't work very well. Uh, and the other thing that you learn, if you read Zuberville's book and you read any good treatment of the history of the week, uh, Sasha Stern is a, a historian at University of College London, is maybe the, the current person, historian, who does the best work, the most work on the history of the seven-day week. Uh, what you learn is that most societies, not just most, every single other society in world history did not have anything that resembles a seven-day week. Uh, and in fact, it began in one place. And there it is. There's the quote that shook me when I read it, that Jewish people, according to him, right? And in fact, according, this is held up over the last 35 years. Um, there's not been any serious claim. If you look on the internet, you'll see all kinds of things that, um, and let me just tell you right now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I can spend time later. It's all false. Uh, there is no evidence for anything um, that resembles the seven day week in history. Um, over the course of the um, first millennium BCE, uh, by, you know, if you read uh, the book of Nehemia, you read the book of Yechezkel, the week is described as an ancient institution already there. Uh, and that's true generally, the evidence for, um, for the seven day week in especially the second century BCE in Judea and in the Jewish world generally is very, very well established and, and rampant. And it's an old institution at that point, And it appears nowhere in human history outside of the Jewish experience until the first century of the common era, when it sort of seems to be adopted um, by, uh, in, uh, um, in, the, in the Roman world. So this shook me. Uh, so on the one hand, I'm like, oh my God, that's awesome. We invented the week, how cool is that, right? On the other hand, I was like, wait a sec, that's not what the Torah says, right? The Torah seems to be saying that the week is built into nature. That was the dilemma, that was the crisis. Now, I'm, I'm very good at compartmentalizing, and so I did compartmentalize that too. I didn't think about it for a long time. Uh, it was prickly in the back of the mind. Now, over the course of the next 15 years or so, I got more and more serious about basically literary approaches to Tanakh, uh, which Drisha has been one of the pioneers for. I mean, David Silver um, and other places too have really um, revolutionized how we, how we read Tanakh over the last uh, generation. And that, I was a little late to that, but I got very seriously interested in that in the last 15 years or so. And then one day in 2011, uh, I was reading the parish with my kids. And then all of a sudden, another time kind of got zapped, was not thinking about this at all. And I realized that's not what the Torah is saying. The Torah is not saying that the week is natural and primordial from time immemorial. It's actually telling us that the week is an invention. Now, that aha moment led to, over the course of the next 11 years, <laughs> or thereabouts, and I'm still working on it, to where I am today. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you exactly how I get into it, but I'm going to get there and wh why and what that means. Let me give you an overview. So I'm going to I'm going to show you the course of the today and more really of the course of the next uh, several sessions, how the Torah is written to teach us about the invention of the seven day week as a radical invention. And um, in order to see this, we got to do a few things. So the first thing we've got to do is read the text closely and carefully um, using what we've learned over the last generation and more. In fact, it turns out Chazal knew a lot. You can see this in the Midrash about the literary conventions that the Tanakh is using, the Torah in particular. OK, so we're going to do that. Second thing we need to do, this is very, very hard. Um, I've been doing it for a while and you may be new to this, which is we are all, everyone on this call, everyone on this planet, almost everyone, except for hunter-gatherers uh, out there, maybe in the Amazon, a few other outskirts of um, civilization, we are all creatures of the weak. It's very, very, very hard for us to do something which is essential for understanding the invention of the seven-day week and, and understanding the Torah's message about that invention, which is to imagine a world that does not have a seven day week and has never heard of it. And can't, you know, can't see it in nature, it's not in nature, can't imagine it. 
it's always very hard for people to think back to what things were like before something that we now take for granted was invented, but that's what we need to do. All right. Um, it's going to be hot. It's, it, there's another thing which is almost like it's very useful, it turns out, to think about the Torah as if it was just kind of a relic that is recovered from an ancient civilization um, that, that otherwise doesn't impact our lives. In other words, imagine Chas Shalom, that Judaism had died away, that Christianity hadn't you know, taken, uh, built on it, etc. But we still had the weak somehow because the legacy of what a Judaism of the um, of that period um, gave to gave to the world, we would still be interested if we discovered the Torah in what the Torah has to say about the seven day week because it would be like the only source, and it's a book that's obsessed with the the seven day week, and so what does it have to teach us? We'd be interested in it from a scientific perspective. And that's kind of the perspective here. All right. When we do all this, as we'll do, what do we get? Well, we actually, this is the case. It's not just, it's not about, a, this is not about a tension between social science or social science and Torah. This will actually be where um, the Torah is an aid to doing better science, social science in particular. That's part of the argument of my book, is that we understand the seven-day week and particularly how and why it was invented or the question about that, better by reading the Torah from uh, carefully and from this perspective. That's part of the argument of the book, and it'll be, the, be what I'll try to develop with you together. The irony is, well, we're not going to end up with an answer to the question, just like we never do when we engage Torah, right? But we'll have much better question that comes out of it. What we'll see is that the seven-day week is sort of like this immense skyscraper, um, or maybe something like a, a huge foundation that we build our lives on top of that we can't see. And that it, its presence will astound us that it's there. That's basically what we get out of this. Okay. All right. Let me say a few things before we get to some text. Let me just give you a little bit more context. And this is going to be something where um, I'm just going to set the table a little bit and set some context. Okay. Let me take a, just a quick second though before I do that. Let me just take a look at the chat. Um, what do we have here? Ozzy, you, you wrote a few comments here. Do you want to unmute for a second, Ozzy, and, and so I don't have to read these so fast? Sure. Hi. Hello? Yeah, I hear you. You're asking a question about um, Midrash. Yeah. Um, so there are all kinds of Midrash, and there are Midrashim also that the Avot observe Shabbat, and there's a lot I could say about that. I think the main thing I would say is, and maybe we'll have some time to come back to this. My, my general perspective on that is um, when the Midrash gives us backstory, it Chas Vashalom is not telling us, right? Its idea is not that the Torah forgot to tell us something, right? Or that the Torah is not very good at telling us the stories it wants to tell us. The Midrash is is, has a lesson to teach us, right? So even when the Midrash is um, describing sort of a backstory, right, or some kind of story that's not actually in the, the, the text, we always have to ask the question, okay, why is it not in the text? And the fact the Torah tells, chooses not to tell us that is primary, right? Um, and so in the Midrash, the, the Midrash's stories about things, you know, obviously Midrashim can contradict each, themselves, um, should be not understood as being, um, whether the Torah should be understood as, as being tre treated literally is always an interesting question too, depending on where in the Torah. But certainly when it comes to Midrash, right? Um, and there are all kinds of Midrash about that are interesting, but I'm mostly not going to cover them here. Um, um, I guess I'm, I'm more interested in, you know, yeah. in terms of natural law, how this relates to natural law. And I just find it hard to believe that God would create a seventh day to rest just in an arbitrary sort of fashion. Interesting. Well, okay. let's hold that thought for a second. It's a good question. I like that question. But let's come back to it, okay? Okay. Let me give you a little more context first, if, that, if I may. Very nice. Okay. All right, cool. All right. So let me just give you a little more context, and then I'm going to get to some text and get to really, the main thing I want to do tonight is to really address that question is like, wait a second, doesn't Breshid, right, doesn't Genesis tell us that the Shabbat, right, and the week is built into nature? That's where I want to get us to tonight. Okay. So let me give you a little, just a little more context. So number one, there's... One way to think about this sort of scientifically, social scientifically, is to ask the question, what is the week, really? 
And one way to approach that is to say, well, what is it like? And what is it unlike? And there's three different ways that, that I think it's useful to, to approach that question, right? So first of all, the week is a social convention. I'll say a little more about what that means. That structures our lives. In that respect, it's like, but also unlike, a lot of other social conventions. Second, the week is um, a sort of temporal social practice. It's something that organizes our sense of time. I put that in quotes because what is time, right? Um, outside of these institutions. The third is that there's actually another institution in world history that is in some respects very much like the week. And that is what's sometimes known as market weeks or market cycles. So let me just say, just to give you some context, a little bit about each of these things, okay? And, and, and we're, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on it today, but I want you to have it in your minds as we think about these issues uh, going forward over the course of um, the weeks. So what is a social convention or an, an institution, sort of an institutionalized social convention that structures our lives that are sort of like the week? So here's a whole bunch of list of them. All right, so writing systems, you know, money, currency, uh, uh, bur burial or cremation practices, how we handle, you know, dead humans, uh, marriage practices, other stage of life, even for earlier stages of life, so naming practices for individuals or for families, uh, and then there's a you know, tech actually is useful here. So our you know, QWERTY, right, is the top five letters. That's the name given to the layout of our keyboard. Right, that people may know originally started because it, uh, it, it's separated keys out on a typewriter so they wouldn't hit each other. And now we now have virtual keyboards, but we stick with that layout, right? Now, there's a lot of other examples you could give. What's common among these examples is a set of different characteristics that are mostly shared by the week as well, but a couple of them are not, okay? One thing to notice about all these different things is that ownership, no one owns these things. It's diffuse like maybe humankind or a culture or society owns them, right? You might own some, you know, things that, that make money off of those platforms, those conventions, right? You might, you might own a funeral parlor, but you don't own, right, the social convention. That's number one. Number two, if you start to think about how these things came about, <clears throat> um, especially in notice number three, that they're, they tend to be universal, these things that I mentioned here, right? That every society has some version of them. That's generally because we can sort of imagine and not unreasonably, though oftentimes we, our intuition about these things is off. We can imagine um, that they were solutions to a problem. Like, you know, dispensing of dead bodies, you can start to imagine what the problem is there. It's not simply just, you know, maybe a health hazard, but also a cult, you know, um, here we are, we think of ourselves as sort of semi-immortal, but yet we're not. How do we manage that problem, et cetera? You know, there are things to, to manage there as a problem. It's not such a surprise to us that these conventions or institutions are universal. We start thinking about them. They solve problems in human societies and they crop up independently of each other for the most part. Yeah, they might then influence each other. Um, another thing about them is that they're essential. We tend to experience these kinds of conventions as like we can't get along without them. It goes together with, you know, we can imagine the problem that they solve. Another aspect of it is until we're aware of cross-cultural um, experience, you know, variation in this, they tend to, we tend to take them for granted. We can't imagine life being different without them. And maybe other, other versions of the practice, like cremation versus burial, for instance, seem alien and maybe just impossible for us to sort of digest. Right? We take them for granted, they feel natural. Another aspect of them is they're very, very, like the QWERTY keyboard, once they're in place, they're path dependent, meaning history really matters. It may be arbitrary whether your culture started with a burial system or cremation system, but you can start to imagine why once that, those kind of pro, um, systems are in place, those conventions are in place, they're very, very, very hard to uproot. And the final thing is that uprooting, trying to get rid of them, so think about there's a lot of debates around, you know, do we do burial, do we cremation? A lot of these things tend to be, and think about, you know, debates about, um, you know, how marriage has evolved in American culture recently, in world culture. Um, we tend to be frustrated sometimes. We tend to these things as good, but also as frustrating and maybe subject to reform. You might want to reform them. What's interesting about the week is it has all these um, in common. But it has one of these things um, not, uh, uh, not in common at all. And arguably, oh, I should have said path dependence should be circled as well. I'll fix that. Um, the week is very, very path dependent. 
Um, there have been two attempts over the last couple of cent centuries, two major attempts to try to replace the seven day week. Uh, one in on the aftermath of the French Revolution, uh, and that failed, and one in the aftermath of the Bolshevik Revolution. And you know, Russia in our minds these days, they tried to get rid of the seven day week as well, and th that failed as well. Um, and that's true for a lot of these things. Uh, they're, once they're in place, very, very hard to uproot. Um, I would say, so I would, I'm gonna emphasize the last point here, blessing and curse. One of the things that's really interesting about the week, let me put this here, is that people generally love the week or at least they love the weekend. So this is from a paper a few years ago by some colleagues of mine uh, that this is just sort of reported happiness levels. And this is one of many, many, many examples of research that shows that people's happiness tends to peak on the weekend, even for unemployed people, not just people who are, who are employed. That was the point of this paper, right? It shows you like people like are happier when they've got other people who are with them, essentially in one way, one reason or another, um, who are sharing time together on the weekend. These are not, obviously most of them, this is from American sample, a uh, vast majority of them are not Jews. Right? So we might love the week, but everybody loves the week at some level. Right? It's experienced as a blessing. Here's an example of, um, this is from COVID. So this is some data that I've collected with, um, uh, with a research assistant. And this is just you know, something we, many of us experienced during COVID. What you see here is tweets and Twitter where people are saying, what, time, what day is it? And look how it spikes right at the beginning of, in, in, or in the middle of March, 2020. Um, and you know, it starts to dissipate. Notice over here, see the spike over here? You know what that is? That is that January 1st that year was not on a weekend. So you know how people get kind of, you know, oh my God, I'm so out of, out, you know, out, out of sorts because the, uh, you know, the, the weekend, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, you know, a holiday basically feels like it's a Sunday, whatever, that kind of thing. That's what that's about. So you're disoriented. Um, the week is experienced as sort of essential, okay? So what's interesting about, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention here is the big glaring difference between the week and all these other things here, right, is that the week did not originate as a parallel, as a solution, it did not originate in parallel in different cultures. It emerged only in one culture, despite the fact that it is exposed, once having spread to the world, it is experienced as essential and good. That's weird, right? You would think something that is experienced as essential and good. And by the way, the week is just an informal social agreement. That's all it is. Any set of humans in world history could have gotten together and decided, let's take a break every four, five, six, seven, eight days. But somehow that didn't seem to happen. Or if it did happen, it didn't really take off. It only took off once. That's weird. That's what the book, my, my book and the project is about at some level. Let me do something. I want to get to some text. I'm going to skip uh, other kinds of times. I'm going to skip by the wit market. I'll come back to that stuff. This is Drisha. Let's do some text. All right. Okay. I see one. Let me just check the chat one second here. Um, Totally. Yes, Laura. Isn't it interesting that people are concerned with the date and the hour of the week? We, so you're guessing that's true. I didn't show you that's true, right? But you're right. And um, we do have comparative data. People are not as worked up about the date. The date just doesn't structure people's lives in the same way the week does, uh, seemingly, right? There's a lot of uh, data that's consistent with that. Um, the one thing I'll say that's on that previous slide I'll mention is there's a big difference between our experience of the week versus our experience of other kinds of calendrical um, uh, 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 features, right? So day uh, and and uh, the date, uh, so hour of the day and then date, which is hour of the day and date are about transition, right? So you're changing. You're going to do something different than you did before. There's going to be a transition going on. Think about contracts, okay? That's what that's, that, that's for. The week is about regular return, right? It's about things that we do again and again and again and again, that also makes the invention of the weird very the week very weird, because it basically needed to be a disruption in routine in order to create new routines. How do you get people to imagine new routines? That's 
Strange. All right, it's a great question. Reminds me of what, what I wanted to say. All right, let's get back to the text. So you should have 10 ops in front of you in one way or another. If you don't, there's at least the main thing I want to talk about. This uh, is maybe one of the most familiar, uh, you know, three verses. In some ways, it's four lines and three verses um, known to traditional Jews. Uh, we all, I think on this call, know this very well from our Friday night Kiddush. We say multiple times on Friday night. We're very familiar with this. And oh, I want to do, so Caleb, do you have, I want to send out the poll. I'm going to activate it. I'm going to ask now for people's participation. And I think, by the way, on, on um, Facebook, if people are out there, maybe they can, can they do this too? I don't know if anyone's actually out there. Um, I might have to drop to send the link in the chat if you're all right with having an open. Yeah, if you could put the link in the chat and then that, that would be perfect. Um, so, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that it's activated. Uh, I'm gonna, oh, I'm going to change my points to this. It takes me a second. I'm not as fast with this as I would like to be. Um, let me share my screen to the poll. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions. I want you to really think about them. Um, if you don't think about them, I won't know, but I'm sure they'll be good answers either way. <laughs> um, you should see, what do you see right now? Do you see the, you see it? Good, good, good. Okay. Um, so I'm asking a question here, which is what aspects of your personal experience your personal experience of Shabbat or the week are missing from the Torah's account of the seventh day. So there's your account of the, Torah, of the seventh day of creation. And, but think about your experience of Shabbat. What's missing? Stay, you can say anything. So this is a, this is a text response and um, you can write anything that you've got multiple times if you want also. What things are missing? People responding because I don't. Let's see. Let's see here for a second. Let me just see. Do people do people get the people are people being able to not sign in? Aha, that's the reason why. One second here for a second. You should be able to see. So if you go to pollev.com, you see that? Um, slash EW Zucker. So it should, it's in the chat too, I think, right? Ah, no, no, no. You got to do um there it is. Thank you, Kayla. So that's the, the um, pollev.com slash EW Zucker. And you'll see a question there. Uh, it should say, you should go to that screen. You should see right away a question that says, what aspects of your personal experience of Shabbat and or the week are missing from the Torah's account of the seven day week? Raise your hand if you see, if you got there and you think, and you're okay. Kayla's got it. We're gonna get this. Alana's got it. Anyone else try it? I'm, I'm looking to see, not yet, all right. Pot, so put that, in, put that in there, Ozzy. There you go, oh, good, we gotta get some answers. Singing, oh, this is interesting, barriers. What is barriers? Someone's gotta tell me what barriers is all about. That's interesting. People can, can people see the answers start to pop up? Yes, okay. Singing around, malacha, interesting. Uh, wine, much, a lot is missing in other words. Is that what much means? Yeah. Kugel, I like kugel. Who should put kugel in there? Nice, I like that one. Yeah, what's in common among all these answers? Like, put your answer, if you think it's in common, you put their answer. Uh, Kayla, you want to answer? Go ahead. Um, what's not present is creation. Okay, so creation is interesting too, but that's not part of your experience. Do you experience creation on, on Shabbat? And maybe you do at some level. I mean, I mean, if you weren't, I mean, it wouldn't be obvious if a Martian came and observed you in Shabbat, uh, the Martian would not imagine you were experiencing creation, right? Yes, even though we do say, we do, we do. 
Right. So your sort of theological, you know, interpretation is one thing, right? Yeah, but what I see is in common. So what do people think is in common there? And those answers. So Ezra? Yeah. So if I understand your question, what's yeah. common about the comments that everybody has made? Yeah. That they wrote in? Yeah. So for the most part, they're social. Social, okay. Social, it might be more specific, human social. Right, that's obvious. The things that people do together, that's just the- Yeah, the things that humans do and they do them together. Yeah, and in the, the description of the, of the Shabbat, there are no humans and there's no interaction, right? And there's no food, <laughs> we're not eating anything, right? There are no creatures even at all, right? So even other creatures eat too, right? Uh, or sing, right? Birds sing, I guess, right? There's none of that. Okay, fair enough. I think um, we'll say more about this, but I think this is a, these are uh, a good start. I'm gonna now, let's see, here's another question. This goes to, I think, what relates a little to what Kayla was asking. Can people see the next question? Yes, you can. Okay, next question is, was anything created on the seventh day? Now, to answer that question for a second, I want you to think back at the first six days and how do we know when something is created? <laughs> Lift box don't sing. I thought it was Yekis who don't sing. <laughs> Joy of Shabbos is missing. Yeah. And it's just interesting, Alana, because that's not mentioned in the Torah, actually. It's mentioned in uh, Ishayah, we get to Oneg Shabbat, right? Uh, which is interesting, right? So rest is created on the seventh day. Okay. Uh, Shabbat is created on the seventh day. Yeah. Yeah. Notice it's hard. Notice how the answers are coming a little slower this time, right? Those are a little bit pulling teeth. I mean, it's a good answer. Shabbat rest. <laughs> uh, so, so, I mean, how do we know when something is created? What's a telltale sign in the first six days of creation that something is being created? How do we know? Uh, you can either text or just uh, answer. What, what, are, what are our indicators? Kayla, yeah. Um, kind of the, pre, the phrase like, and it was good. Okay, right. Um, the, that's not always the case, right? But there's not, that's a common thing. And that does not show up here, right? What other, what other phrases show up that are not here? that are common, like, uh, what's the most common thing? Common verb, let there be, vayihi, right? Yihi, right? Vayir, vayivoker, yihi, right? Um, there will be. What's another common verb that we see, or maybe one that God does? Omer, good, Noah, right. Yeah, vayomer. When God, you know, this is the famous thing about Genesis, right? Is that in creation, is that it's through um, Baruch Shamar, right? We say that every day in the beginning of Suge de Zimra. Baruch Shamar Vaya Haolam. There, there's the, the, the Amar and there's the Vahaya, right? And there's no Amar and there's no Haya in this, um, these three verses. None of that. So it's not clear what, if anything was created here, or if it was, it was di very different, right? It's not obviously a day of creation. All right, let's look at the next question. Here's, I think, my favorite question, okay? Of, um, uh, of the questions that I compose, this is my favorite. All right, this is now a poll. Is Vayachul, we say every Friday night, right? Is it poetry or is it prose? And I'm giving you, an, uh, you know, or is it in between? Which is it? You're seeing the responses, right? When people answer, right? I could hide that, but I guess it doesn't matter so much, right? It's like, it shouldn't affect your answers, right? Looks like it's really funny. Very good, I like that. Okay, so I can't supply the humor, but you can. Thank you. Has everybody voted? I want to seek out everyone's answers on this one. Everyone should be able to vote on this one. Come on. You know this text more than any, but, and then any text uh, in Judaism, right? You got you to gotta, uh, make a vote. Has everybody voted? No, I didn't vote because my Hebrew is not good enough to vote. Oh, that's not true. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll make a, all right. So uh, in between is winning. Okay. Anyone still need to vote or we got that? Okay. It's in between. 
All right. So now here's my next question, which is another tech, another word cloud. So vast majority of you, by the way, that's what I expected. I never asked this question before in a class. So I was, uh, that's what I expected. Vast majority of you see some lyrical elements, some elements of poetry. Now justify it. What do you see that makes you say it's at least somewhat poetry, not prose? Repetition, okay, we'll get to that. Assonance, okay. Ooh, repetition gets getting a lot of votes. Anything else? Phrasing, okay. Any other reasons? Repetition is winning somehow, but maybe there's some other things that you're seeing. Well, who wants to tell me about the repetition? Rhythm, okay. Repetition, rhythm, assonance, phrasing, I like it. All right, well, let's stop there. You can keep on adding, but anyone wanna tell me what's, what's repeating? The Ashera Sa. Ashera Sa, multiple times, right? And then there's a version of it at the end, right? Which is, um, what, uh, right? Uh, Asher, what is it? Uh okay. Lugim Nasot, right? A little set version of it. Good. What else repeats? Yom Hashvi'i. Okay, Yom Hashvi'i three times, right? Yeah. There is also like a lot of vubs, right? Yeah, and in fact, so um, Noah's saying, right, look at the beginning, right? We say, Vayechulu, uh, Vayechal, Vayishbot, right? And especially Vayechulu, Vayechal, right? Uh, if you're like me, you actually, you know, I don't know, I say Kiddush a lot, but I still sometimes forget exactly. Like it's, it can trip you up, right? Um, you know, which is which? Uh, where are you in it? Vayechul, uh, Vayechal. Uh, anything else? In terms of repetition. And then we're getting assonance from that a little bit there, right? Anything else that um, repeats? Yeah, it doesn't say it is evening was morning. That's another way that it stands out. That's, I, yeah. Um, anything else that repeats? So let me show you a little bit what I have here. And. Stop my screen. And this. That was fun with the polls, right? I enjoyed doing that. <laughs> I think it's a good way to get. Um, um, and I really enjoyed your answers. Um, let's see here. Okay, so let me get back to my PowerPoint. Okay. So those are the three questions I had again. And let me just tell you what my answers are, which are in line with yours. So pretty much, you know, the first answer, pretty much everything about our experience is missing, right? The human part is missing. Another really important part that's missing, hugely important, right, is there's nothing about the Torah's account of the seventh day that implies a cycle in any way, right? When we experience Shabbat, we're never experiencing just that Shabbat, right? It's like, think about people have read Heschel on the Shabbat, right? It's like every Shabbat, right? It's always part of a cycle, which is true about the week generally, right? It's always in the context of, say nowadays, you know, uh, the Parsha cycle or other things that are cycling. There's nothing about a cycle in here, yeah? Um, there's, you know, we got to, I think all the things I wanted to mention that were different, by the way, so it's not simply that those verbs show up in the first days of creation, vayomer, vayihi, vayar is another big one, right? What did God see? There's none of that here either uh, that goes together with kitov. They tend to be like it's, there's a you know, meaningful number of times that, that they show up. Uh, another thing I think it's worth mentioning is in the earlier days of creation, there's processes set in motion, right? So thinking about like the fruited trees, et cetera, and pru revu for, um, fish and for um, humans, 
There's none of that here. No processes set in motion, okay? And my answer is this, it's at least poetry or some combination of poetry and prose, right? But it's got a lot of lyric um, elements. Um, to the, I wanna say to the extent that it's poetic, right? What does that tell us? It implies that this text, right? Is trying to get us to feel something, right? Not just to convey information but to convey a feeling that can't be otherwise expressed so easily as we do with poetry, right? Um, and I wanna say something about the structure, okay? So let me just show you something else. So here's the lyrical elements off the bat, some of which you, you were mentioning. There's one that you didn't mention that I wanna emphasize, which is look at the reds, right? And maybe this is the assonance people were mentioning. So there's a lot of coal, right? the word, the shoresh, the root for complete, right? It's in the verb vayichulu and vayichal. It's also in mikol malachto. Did I miss one actually? Uh, uh, oh, I did miss one. I forgot to mark that one. There's so many that I forgot to miss one. Bechol tzvam over here, right? There's another kol over there. And interestingly, you also have, I would argue, I won't, you know, uh, you've got the reverse of it, lach and malachto. So especially when you do by chulu layalach, you're basically playing a lot with chulu's signs a lot, right? So there's something going on there. All right, let me show you something else. So one of the most basic forms of literary, sort of lyrical forms in, in, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, we see again and again and again, more common in Nach, I think, right, is parallelism, right? Tanakh is endlessly kind of doing slight, sort of repeating itself with slight variation, but basically saying the same thing twice. Often we know what something means, an obscure word, um, because it's in a repeated a phrase that's repeated twice, let's say in the same verse or in successive verses. That's another thing going on here structurally, very important, I would, I would suggest, right? In particular, these two phrases are really darn close with each other, right? Which is one of the reasons we get confused sometimes in doing Vayichulu. I missed the, it's actually those two. Sorry, one second. That's the wrong uh, animation. These two are very, very close. Those two are like super, super, super close. Yeah? And actually, any two pairs of these is pretty close to each other. Okay? I want to suggest something else which is not only is the, are these two, right, a parallelism, but the whole thing, including even the verses prior and after the, um, the, the, the day of creation are all part of what's known as staircase parallelism, meaning that if you go from one verse to the next, there's a sense in which the next um, or the next stair in the staircase doesn't add any new information, okay? So in this verse, which is the last verse, the sixth day of creation, it says, and God saw everything that he made. Everything was made. And he said, thought it was good, and that was the sixth day, right? Everything was made. If you go to the next stair, and, and the heavens and earth were complete. Well, we already know that. The prior verse already told you this. And if you go to the next stair, and God completed the work that he did, well, we knew that already also because we knew. We read the first six days of creation. We know that it's God is doing the creating, right? So it's not telling us anything new here either. Yeah? And well, he completed it. So he stopped. Right? Same thing, nothing new. Now here's a tricky one. You might say he's adding something by blessing and sanctifying the day. But I'm here to tell you nothing happened. How do I know this? Because in the other two cases with the fish and with the humans, if you look back, when God blesses something, he then says something should happen. Pru uruvu milua ta'aretz. Be fruitful and multiply. We know what it means, something happens. Like it specifies, here, nothing happens. I would say that the way you should read this um, phrase is, and God 
um, bless the seventh day and sanctify it by virtue of resting. That's the key vo Shabbat is by virtue of resting from all the work that he did. In other words, his resting entails, it implies blessing and sanctification. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense. What do you mean because? God was forced? It's contingent? He was forced to bless and sanctify? God's not forced to do anything. Nothing can cause God to do anything. So it can't mean because, this key over here, it is by virtue of, by virtue of, and therefore, nothing new happened. And here's the last one. We think we know that Ela told us Shaman Baharetz is the preamble to the, to the next um, version of the creation story. But if you didn't read anything else that happened, you would read it as follows. If all you had was this verse, it would be, and these were the entailments, right? The toladot, what, what came out of, what entailed, was entailed by the, the creation of the heavens and earth. That is, this is a refer reference back to the most famous verse in the Bible, the first one, Reshit bara Elohim Shemayim Ba'aretz. That's what this is, right? It's, and that's it. It's everything. In other words, it's just another way of saying the same thing was said before. So here's what's amazing about this structurally. It's a staircase of nothing. Nothing happened. It's just all different ways of saying God completed the creation. That's it. But, 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 of course, it is saying something, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't waste six verses on it. And here's what I would say. It's actually giving us different ways of understanding the completion of creation. Okay? So, where are we? So, if you think about this from a, from a Talmudic perspective, what's our Havamina? What we would have thought? Is it adding something to what we might have thought about what completion of creation actually means? Okay, so if you all you had was that the last verse of the sixth day, you wouldn't have so the fact that God saw everything that he did and he saw that it was good doesn't necessarily mean that he's done. He could do more. Right. And so by that it was complete tells you that actually creation is done. That we have here is a final stable world. That's number one. Number two, it tells you, sorry, the next staircase tells you. So it switches the perspective. It's an action taken by God. God completed, right? The work that he was doing. It's giving you another angle on it, but it's telling you something really important, which is that completion was a deliberate action. And it's saying yom. It's, it's, it's saying that it took some time and some sense, whatever that means, right? And by the way, it didn't involve speech. It's telling you that's important too, right? But it's a deliberate action. In other words, it sort of implies that the creator cares to tie up his work. He cares about his creation and he ties it up. It's an, act, it's an action. Then it's telling you something, right? That it's teaching you something about the word Shabbat. It's saying this action we just told you about that the creator tied things up, right, and he cares about his creation, is something called Sabbathing. That's the name we're going to give for it. And it's a form of non-work, right? It's separated from work, mikol malachto, it's separate from work, right? That somehow is an act of completion. That's what that is. But again, it's not really saying anything happened, right? Nothing happened. It's just giving you different angles on thinking about how, how, um, what didn't happen, okay? Uh, and then somehow this action entails a mysterious positive valence, something positive happened. That's what we call blessing and sanctification, bracha and kedusha. And you could say also that it somehow seems to fulfill creation because it's hearkening back to the creation process. Okay, obviously I'm referencing here famous chazals about Shabbat being the fulfillment of creation. And then the last thing is it's saying this whole process in some sense can be thought of as a yom, like one, whatever that means, it's one day. Um, and that includes the seventh yom. That was part of that yom because it comes after it. So there's almost like two meanings of yom here. One subsumes the other, but it's different angles on the same process. I know that I've got two minutes left. So let me just, I'm gonna give you a takeaway from this week. 
And I'll stop and I said I would give 10 minutes and I'll do that too, okay? I threw a lot at you right here. But here's the most important thing I think to take away, right? So I traveled a long way from, oh my God, you know, the week is, is you know, built into to, to nature. What I want to suggest, right, is that Genesis, Breshit, does not present Shabbat as a human social convention. If that's what we're interested in, that's not what it's doing. It knows how to tell you about what a human social convention is like, and we'll see that as we go forward. That's elsewhere in the Torah, but it's not here. That's not what this is here. The most important thing to recognize is there are no nouns relating to Shabbat here. The word Shabbat here shows up only as a verb, vayishvot, or Shabbat. It's not a noun, a thing, an entity that exists. There's no cycle here. No humans are involved. No indication that humans are told about this. Right? Putting Midrash aside. And by the way, if you look through your book of Genesis and you just do, you know, search on the Shoresh, Shabbat, it shows up one other time in the rest of Genesis. And it's as a verb and it's in the, you know, Parsha Noach. It has nothing to do with this. It's an interesting verb, uh, context. Um, it doesn't show up as a noun, as an institution, as the week until later. We'll talk about that. So what is going on in creation? It is metaphysical. It's some kind of mysterious description of God and God's, we don't, you know, the Rambam taught us so well, right? It's hard for us to know what it means to be God. It's giving us some kind of feeling about that, some kind of sense of that, but not something that we can relate to really as human beings in any human sense, right? It's giving us some idea. I'd say the artful poetic construction of this, and there's more to say about that. I'm not saying this is the last word on how to think about this sort of poetically, is designed to teach us, I think, that Shabbat is somehow something really important. It's super important, right? Um, it's not like a creation like other creations, but it still seems really important. And in some sense, it's a really important creation that is actually nothing at all. Nothing was actually created here. I want to say one last thing, which is there's a really important reason outside the text itself why it's a big mistake and basically everybody does it. Um, Bible scholars all do this, academics do this. Um, and most, I'd say a lot of, um, in our tradition, we do this, but there's some really important exceptions that we'll talk about. Why it's just a basic error. It's wrong to read Breshit as saying that the weak is built into nature. And you don't need a text for this. What's the reason? Because if you were in the second, um, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the first millennium before the common era, and you were the audience, especially early audience for the Torah, you would have known, of course, the week is not built into nature. Only we as creatures of the week can imagine the week could be built into nature because we take it for granted. We are creatures of the week. But people who were only learning about the week for the first time obviously wouldn't have thought the week was built into nature. How could they? And so that can't be possibly what the Torah's message is. It would have been nonsensical to them. All right. Um, last thing, Rashi. So where is the week launched as a human cycle? We'll get there in the next weeks and weeks ahead. Rashi tells us basically saying, um, what is this business about sanctification and blessing? Nothing happens here. He's saying, just like I just a few minutes ago, right? Where is this blessing and sanctification happening? He's saying it's in the mind. That happens the first experience that B'nai Israel have with the Shabbat. We usually think about it as their first Shabbat. And I'm going to say, and I'm not the first person to say this, this is not just about the first Shabbat. It is the first experience of the seven-day week, and that's what the Torah is teaching us about there. That's what that first, uh, when I first realized that's what the Torah is uh, doing, that was Parsha, Parsha B'Shalach, and that's what we'll, we'll get to. All right, let me stop there. I'm going to, I'll put up on my screen um, where we're headed, and I can say something more about that, but um, it is 9.02. I apologize for that. Like I said, I've never, I put this, this uh, set of lectures together before and so I wouldn't know exactly what the time was going to be. Um, I see people, a lot of people are still on, so I appreciate that. Um, any questions that people have or observations or like, uh, I'm happy to, to take them. Uh, Alana, go ahead. So the first thing that came up for like me was that if the idea of like the seven day week is really just a social construct, then it kind of 
totally justifies the fact that the world wasn't actually created in only six like of our days. I would say so for the so word, by the way, construct is a tricky thing. So I'm, I'm using the word um, convention, right? So, and, or maybe an institution to the extent it's institutionalized. I do that a little deliberately. I might sometimes use the word practice because I want to say, so a contract a little bit sometimes can mean something like a concept. Week is not just a concept, right? It's very much something that's about regular social behavior. Back to what Deborah was saying about like when we experience, and we were all saying, we experienced the Shabbat, it's about social interaction. And the week is like that also. So anyway, just... This is me being a persnickety sociologist, um, but I think it's important. Uh, but contract could mean something like that. I think, um, yes, um, I think that is very, it's a very astute observation. Uh, Menachem Liebtag, um, as people I think in the Jewish world know, knows very well, I think um, has a similar um, uh, you know, idea about what Breshit is up to. Um, that in a way, there's a sense in which what we'll talk about moving forward is that B'nai Israel's experience of the week and its introduction to them, uh, Shabbat in the week, or you could call it the Sabbath week is the way I would, I would say it, um, is primary in a way. And then Breshit is a way for human beings to understand what it means for God to be the creator and how it can be that Shabbat is kind of a signal of God the creator. Sort of what that means. Um, but I, yes, I think it is broadly consistent with Thinking that the, the you know not to take the the um, yom in um, you know in the in the in the in the in the for seven days of creation literally right by the way there's no by or evoke what happened to the seven days endless right and we have you know, we have um, traditional you know interpretations that sort of see that it's like we're all we're always in that seventh day or something like that and you know, like I said the the next verse tells you uses the yom word yom apparently differently right and so already right there you're alerted to the fact that yom Yom doesn't mean, it's hard to, to say that Yom, means, you know, there's obviously also the famous point, which is, oh, let me show you something else, which is, well, we have that point up there. Um, there is a text, uh, much later text than the Torah, um, that is referring to the Torah and has as its agenda to, to, try to try to argue that the week is actually built into nature. This is from Jubilees. Right, and what I'm showing you here is the fourth day of creation according to Jubilees. And the book of Jubilees, um, notice what it's doing here. In the fourth day, God created the sun and the moon and the stars, right, and put them up. And that's sort of roughly similar to what it says in the Torah. Um, and it says something similar about how they're gonna um, kind of rule our experience of day and night. Uh, it's, it's not exactly what we have in the Torah. Um, and notice over here, it says something, it says, and it says in the to actual Torah um, that it's going to be for the calendar, meaning um, for, you know, the lunar solar calendar. But notice there's a word over here, the Shabbatot. This Jubilees is obsessed with um, Sabbaths very, um, in various ways. And it wants to, it adds that in. It's really bothered by the fact that the seven day week is not actually um, built into the Torah's account of creation. And so it puts it in. It does a couple other things like that. Um, it also tries, you know, Jubilees is famous for putting together a calendar, which is 364 days, um, because that's a multiple of seven. Um, and so it's, it's kind of out of luck, though, because 364 doesn't work very well. And so it's, it's you know, you're, you're picking your poison when you're trying to sync up the week with the lunar and the, and the solar cycles. And they try it that way to obviously take off. Um, but they were trying to build it sort of into a solar conception of, uh, um, of the world. Um, so it's an interesting contrast case. But it also tells you, it's another indicator of how deeply, deeply entrenched the seven-day week was as an institution um, by the time, this is, I forget now, second, second century. You can see it also in the story of Hanukkah. The week is very, very well institutionalized where it's not known by anyone else other than us at that time. Um, other observations or questions? Um, I still see some, I see some pretty good ones in the chat. Unfortunately, uh, the Facebook Live crowd is pretty silent. I, I have no a problem. Question. We won't hold it against them. Hello, Charles. You have a question? Yes. Uh, did you just say that Jubilees is uh, older than Genesis, but that? No, 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 no. What did no, you well, say? I'm not, I'm not getting into the dating of the Torah, but by anyone's account, 
uh, Jubilees is much later. It's it's clearly a reaction. Well, it's I, known I, as the, like rewritten Bible. It's I misheard it's, you. I misheard you. Yeah, it's sort of like proto midrash or something like that. It's like uh, it attempts okay, to sort sorry, of sorry, I misheard you. But to, to give you a, a lesson of some kind. Oh, that's not my area of expertise, but it, definitely much later. Yeah, like the midrash, it kind of wants to give you backstory. It starts off with a whole backstory about Moshe on the Har Sinai, um, and it's. Clearly, you know, whatever. I'm not an expert, but I do think it's very I have a question. Yeah. Are you suggesting that the this is Jerry? That the world, yes, that the world's huh? observance of the week, um, incorporating it into the natural flow of things, is from happened after the Hebrews started practicing that, and that the Hebrews did that based on the Bible. Like, what's the flow of how this happened? Yeah. So from a scientific perspective, I'll tell you what I know from, from the scientific perspective, and partly I would say, um, I mean, there's not going to be anything that's materially different from uh, what, what I would say the Torah is presenting. I mean, the Torah is in general not interested in telling history uh, in the way that we're used to it. Um, that's, uh, um, I, maybe some people would contest that, but it, it, the, the notion of history as we, um, as we have come to understand the discipline of history is a Greek um, uh, innovation that comes up later, essentially. That's just not what uh, was what what what, what um, the form of literature that was around at the time. Um, and oh wait, I forgot. Now I missed your question. It's getting late. What was As it again? As a social scientist, how would yeah. how, Can you just yeah 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 yeah, yeah. throw it out so for I'll us? Tell you how did what, it... what I think we know. I spend a lot of time talking to people. Um, so I'm I'm a social scientist, not an historian. So I can get in trouble that way. Also, I do. I have spent a lot of time with history on this. The, I can share, I can't really share with you copyrighted. I can tell you about, um, there's a paper, there's a, the, the, the scholar who does um, the most and best and most recent work in this area is a, um, a very interesting uh, man, uh, does a lot of work on um, ancient calendars, particularly Jewish calendars. His name is Sasha Stern, S-A-C-H-A at University of College London. And um, I think I'm representing his, well, you know, it, it, with something like the following. So by the, say, second century BCE, uh, the, the Sabbath week, that is our, this, the week itself, but a particular form of the seven-day the seven week, which we're familiar with, a lot of elements that we're not familiar with, um, or that were not yet there, like, you know, things like the Torah reading cycle, things like that, Kogel, <laughs> um, were already in place and very well established. They were ancient already by then. Um, he would probably disagree with me a little bit, or he would be very conservative about that. Uh, that they're that they're very well entrenched. Uh, that that would be clear. Um, if if you, uh, some people would say there were some predecessor institutions. I can talk more about that. Um, I think that I have very strong views about. I would say um, scholarship in that area that I don't think is um, very strong. Uh, people like to conjecture about a lot of things, but. Um, Basically, there's nothing like the seven-day week that's observed um, until, and so outside Jewish communities, and we're talking about Jewish communities now also from, from Babylonia all the way to um, Egypt. Um, and that is, um, there's evidence, um, most scholars would say there's good evidence of the seven-day week being observed in the, um, I'm going to say the fifth century um, BCE. So now we're talking about several hundred years, a few hundred years before that. Um, um, with there's this papyri that were found in what's now Aswan, Egypt, which was um, a um, known as Elephantine. A, um, I think that's a Greek name, but then it was Persian. Um, maybe that's a Persian name. I don't know. Uh, where there was a Jewish garrison. So it's Purim time. Very good place to end tonight. Purim time, right? So this is a Jewish garrison of the Persian army, Persian imperial army garrison in Elephantine, and there's a, there's some people would contest some elements of the evidence here, but a lot of evidence that they were, you know, of, of, of various practices, Jewish practices, um, including Shabbat back then. There's even earlier, the earliest evidence that some serious scholars point to that's epigraphic evidence, meaning not from the Torah, um, would be, I think, in the seventh century. Uh, there's actually, I can find this people who are interested. Uh, there's like the stila somewhere in Israel, I forget, which is like somebody, a worker complaining that like he's gonna have to work up to the Shabbat. To Shabbat. Uh, it's pretty cool, actually. Um, that's, I mean, you're talking about a lot. So in world historical terms, right, if you take that series of which 
serious people do, and I'm not talking about like, you know, uh, super from people. These are, these are people, uh, you know, are not traditional in their observance and that kind of thing. We think this is evidence of the week that far back. And certainly the Torah is describing as an instant, I mean, sorry, Nach. So like I said, Yechezkel, Nechemia are describing it as an in, institution. You're talking about many hundreds of years that I think it's reasonable from a scientific perspective to think that Jews from Babylon to um, Egypt were observing the seven day week in our particular way. Um, and then it's only starts to be to adopt it and appropriate it outside of the Jewish community, seemingly in North Africa in the first century of the common era. Um, seemingly what happened was probably in Alexandria or in cities like that, where there were very large prosperous Jewish communities that Jews were taking off with Shabbat and their commercial transaction partners um, you know, would notice this and they would also basically wouldn't have their counterparties to, and this is now conjecture, uh, but we do know is that then they started to like give it pagan planetary meaning, right? And that's where we get Sunday, moon day, et cetera, is a legacy from that period. All right, it is um, 9.15. I appreciate people staying on this part. Yeah. This is very, it's, it's, yeah. it's awesome. I appreciate and, that. Um, Dr. Zuckerman, if people yeah. have any questions that they Ezra, want to ask Ezra. you, how can they get in touch with you? How can people get in touch with you? Oh, so first of all, the form, right? Did we share the form? Uh, not yet. Let me get that to you. All right, let's do that. Thank you. Um, so uh, um, I, I, if, if you can, it'd be great. Uh, we can send this out maybe by email also, maybe, Kayla? Yeah, um, I, think I'm, I think I'm not going to keep people. This will go out by this. this okay, so we'll just send it out. Class, you will be um, it has your name. It has some, you can put some notes on there. Um, you can always email me also. I'm a big emailer uh, because I'm, you know, uh, I'm a Gen X or not a millennial, right? Millennials only text or something. I don't know. And then I don't know what some of you are even younger than that do. Um, you can DM me, I guess. What's What's that? Good, right. um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Um, but last thing I'd like you to do, if you can, um, if you want to do some homework for next time, definitely not required in any way. Um, just read. Uh, the things to read would be each of the two versions of the Ten Commandments, right? So what we're going to deal with next time is why in Shemot, so this is Exodus, uh, help me out here, 20, right? Shemot, Achaf, uh, yeah. Um, takes me a while to the Parax. Parshas, I know. Yitro. Um, yeah, we've got um, a version of the, ten, of the fourth commandment that is, um, by our counting, uh, the Shabbat commandment, that thinks that that you know um, links Shabbat with creation as we just did. We see it again in Bishamru, that's in Kitisa in, in Exodus 31. Same thing. But in Deuteronomy 5, or is it 4? I forget. Um, you can see the Ten Commandments in Dvarim, that's Parshat Vait Hanan. Um, it seems to root uh, Shabbat in Itziat Mitzrayim, in the Exodus. And so it seems like a contradiction. It's not as famous a contradiction as the Zachar and Shamor, or tension, put it that way. We'll deal with both those things next time. And the other thing to read if people are interested in is the text I just referenced, which is um, Exodus 16, right? So that's the story of Shabbat and Amman. That story we're going to return to again and again and again and again and again. It is far and away the most important story uh, about the Shabbat in the Torah. And it's very strange that we don't read it as much as we should if we think about the meaning of it. But uh, there'll be one other story that's going to be really important too. Was that a question, Alana? You your hand up? No, I was saying that it was Perak four. <laughs> oh, it is four. I always forget those things. It's by Khan. Yeah. All right, good. Okay. Uh, a pleasure, everybody. Have a oh, um, have a um, a good Chodesh and a Shabbat Shalom. And um, let's pray for uh, peace in the world and particularly in the Ukraine. Thank you, everyone, for joining us as part of our as part of our fall semester as our series on work. And if you want to catch up with the recording of this class, it will be posted on Drisha Live in about five minutes and in avail and available in our in our in our audio library in a few in a few days. Um, have a good evening wherever you are and see you next week. Thanks Kayla. Thanks everybody. That was great. Bye. Right. Thank you, Ezra. Ezra, I'm also in Providence. That's where I live.
Oh, awesome. Yeah. All right. I go well, to Emmanuel. Deborah was, uh, Deborah over here was uh, my second mom growing up in Providence. Okay. Nice. Basically. Um, so I'm really glad to have her. Promise, if you join <laughs> Wednesday, it's going to be hard. You know, if you don't come next time, I'm going to be like, you know, oh my God. Oh, no, I'm going to be here next week. And then <laughs> I got you. Yeah. And then oh, I, I meant Deborah. You're off the hook, Alana. Don't feel any pressure. Oh, my family's definitely. going to Germany, but it's going to be 1 a.m. there because they go to daylight. Oh, no, no. Watch yeah. it. Watch the recording then. Get some sleep. No, I'm going to come. I love, I love staying up late. <laughs> All right. Fine. All right. All right safe travels, Bye. everybody. Take care.